Hello, everybody, and welcome to. He's already laughing. To the. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second Give Today podcast. Or podcast, if you're or from podcast. the north. My name's Bryony. Sat Mine next isn't. to me. <laughs> My name is sometimes John, sometimes James, sometimes John James. See how you feel. Yeah. So, John James, John James. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What have we been up to this week? Um, what have we been up to? Just a bit of a quiet week, really. Not really been doing it. No, I'm only kidding. We've completely read on our website to be givetoday.co.uk. Yeah. Uh, so we've done that about makes, a thousand hours this week. That makes it sound like we've managed to do it all this week. No, we haven't done it all this week. We've done... Well, what was that thing that you said about ten percent? the last 10% takes? Uh, 90% of the progress in 10% of the time. The last 10% of progress takes 90% of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And I think anyone that's worked on a big project will know exactly yeah. what that's like. So we have been ironing out actually probably the last 2% yes. this week. And it's been late nights. It's been good fun. I mean, for example, last night it was probably about 1am when we did the final test to make sure that we could take <laughs> take payments for donations and realise that yeah, the, the, the confirmation email wasn't working. and It's all working now. It gives you an idea of how it was very last. Because I have a tendency of uh, giving us ridiculous targets, don't I? It's a little bit of an underestimate. Underestimation. <laughs> yeah, I tend to, to say, right, let's get this done. By tomorrow. <laughs> and then she, Brownie just looks at me like, oh my God, what are you saying this for? Um, but we actually did it. We actually did it, see. I knew we could. So we launched it. It was nice, actually, because while we've not been pushing the old website because we were, we were sort of gearing up to the new one, obviously the amount of traffic had, had dropped and, and stuff. And it was nice because we got our last donation last night, didn't we? Life Share got a donation. Underwear, men's underwear. A waterproof coat and a six pack of shower gel, which was nice. Yeah. Yeah. Good good items to send. Good items. Always, to send. always needed. Definitely. I mean so, it was only a couple of weeks ago Life Share messaged us and said, We've completely run out of mm-hmm. men's underwear. Mm-hmm. Is there anything you can do to give us a hand? Oh, so yeah. I know that that in particular yeah. will be really useful right now. And that's a nice segue to one of the new features that we've got on the website, which is Charities no longer have to message you or I. Yeah. To yeah, say. They've, they've got their own login. <laughs> yeah, before how it, how it worked was they would email us and say, this is what we need for this month, this is what we need right now, today, and then we would go on and do it for them. But we were new to all of this and we were just doing it the, the easiest possible way. And now that we're old hats at this, uh, is that a phrase, old hats? Anyway. Old hats, old hands. But um, it was okay at the beginning with four charities, yeah. even when it was 10 charities. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's fine. But <clears throat> yeah, 50 of you, it gets a bit yeah. bit hard to <laughs> handle. So also this week we have signed up, well, we've signed up a few new charities recently. We've had Centrepoint. We've got the Clock Tower Sanctuary. Clock down Tower in Sanctuary Brighton. in Brighton. Uh, Disability Stockport we've got coming up, I believe. Yeah. And um, got a couple of housing trusts yeah. going on there. Really yeah. important about getting people into accommodation and giving them somewhere stable to live and begin to build their yeah. lives. It's really, really important. And you can go on and donate things, even things like plate sets and bedding and towel, yeah. towel, uh, and, and towel, towel <laughs> and towels. Each new person coming through need they have nothing, so they need absolutely everything to, to set them up. Yeah. And you can so, help that. You can help someone in their new life. So how it works now with with the with the shops is for any charities that are listening to this thinking, well, I, I don't know what, if I want to sign up to this or how does it work. Basically, the charity logs in and they have a, a pre-built list that we've put together over the last year from different requests from people and all that from different suppliers. And they basically tick... They, well, they add to their own shop the things that they need. I think there's about 300 and something, 300 plus items in this Growing big list uh, for them to choose from. And it's, as Brandy says, it's everything from the obvious things that you'd think about. But also, we try and push the idea of more specific things that people wouldn't necessarily think of donating to charity. It, basically, if a charity spends money that they could spend elsewhere on buying an item, 
that item can be bought by the public. So that's what we've been doing. We've also, coming up, we've got a chat. Well, we've already had it. We've already had the chat, but it will be coming up in this podcast with Carol. From Stopford Cat Rescue, which, for those that don't know, Stopford is... Stockport. Stockport. Well, I think, yeah, was it it's what Stockport was called people, before? People in Stockport are called Stockfordians. Yes. There you go. Stockford cats. They are fantastic. All volunteers. I mean, she'll tell you all about it, mm. but they're all volunteers and they help all the furry cats of Stockport that need homes. Really yeah. fantastic organisation, so stay tuned. Stay tuned. I mean, we could we could put it in now, couldn't we? I think that we've explained what we've done this week. Yeah, should we? Should we? Should we? So we are recording. No curse words or anything. <laughs> okay. Um, so next up we have Carol from Stockford Cats. Hello, Carol. Hello. Hello. Um, so first of all, uh, if you could just start by telling us a little bit about Stockford Cats and the work that you do, please. Right. Well, the true full name is actually Stopford Cat Rescue. Ah, okay. And um, we're a small local charity. We set up three years ago and uh, we work in Stockport, Greater Manchester. Mm-hmm. Uh, we run entirely by volunteers and uh, the cats and kittens that we have in care are looked after by fosterers in, in their own homes. Uh, we have various aims. Um, mm-hmm. Firstly, we find good homes for stray and unwanted cats. Yeah. Secondly, we promote neutering. We very strongly feel that that is a thing to do. Um, yeah. We help with the neutering costs where people are struggling with uh, finances. Um, and also we do what's called TNR, which is trap, neuter, return work uh, with feral and community cats. Okay. Um, and thirdly, we uh, our third aim really is to educate the public about cats yeah. uh, because there's a lot of misconception around and people generally want to know more. Uh, we produce newsletters twice a year and information sheets and uh, hopefully when, when possible um, we're hoping to give talks to schools and other organisations. So that, that is Stockford Cat Rescue. Brilliant. Um, Fabulous to my role within the organisation. Uh, we are a very small team and uh, we tend to uh, multitask. Yeah. Uh, we have multiple roles. I'm the chair of the trustees. I'm also yes. the secretary. And I also do work with fosterers and I do a lot of the rehoming. Goodness so um, we are all busy people because there are only actually seven people on the committee and um, we all have our specific jobs mm. and then we have a lot of helpers but uh, we're all, we do all try to help out where we can and fit in to help overall helping the cats in our care. Absolutely. Yeah, sounds like you've been quite busy to have so much going on, but uh, how long have you worked in this sort of area? Um, well, as, as far as, I, I was a full-time teacher, but when I went uh, retired, I took part, retirement part-time first, and in the spare time that I had, I went to work for... Uh, another charity um, a big cat charity Mm -hmm. and I helped out there Um, I first of all just started with socializing the cats um, finding out more about them and then doing some vet runs and taking sick cats to the vets and then I moved on to doing the homing work Uh, I was very interested in the cats from that point of view and that's Mm -hmm. how I got involved and I just got more and more involved and then eventually we set up our own rescue charity and I'm more involved again excellent I mean, this sounds like quite an obvious question because I I know what would be the best part for me, but what would you say is the best part about your job? The best part really is when you see a cat or a kitten uh, come in uh, from a rescue situation, either someone doesn't want the cat because they um, have too many other obligations Mm -hmm. or there's a problem with the cat or the cat's been abandoned and in the street and then a few weeks months on you see the cat homed to a nice loving family and they send you photographs and videos and you put them on your facebook page and say happy homings yeah um, <laughs> and uh, and that's the best part of the job because you, you see everyone wins and the cat's happy and the people are happy and and that's good so that's the best part definitely fabulous we actually have two rescue cats ourselves we do um, 
and nice. they came home first time and they're they're so scared and it it's really now only a couple of years later i think their actual true personalities can shine they've mm. sort of left their old life behind yeah i mean we we took on a um well we were originally we were just going to to be fostering the mummy cat and we went there and just fell in love with the kitten as well so we took <laughs> we took both of them back and uh, funnily actually because the first um the first month of well, the first couple of months actually of us having them we had been told that the kitten was a boy so we had been oh, calling him typical, him. Yes. typical. and then we were yes, like there's yes. no there's nothing going on there's nothing growing what's going on so we had somebody come out <laughs> and they said yep you've got a girl there so yes we'd yes. misgendered our cat yes uh, well what about the name what did you have to change the name in that case no we now have a girl cat called steve French. So yeah, yeah. So um, yes, we, do, we we <laughs> we have a, a cat in care uh, called Dave. What oh, gender yeah. do you think? Yeah, female. female oh, right. So Dave and Steve could have a, a nice nice catch up together. In um, fact, my very first cat was I was told was a boy, so I called him Sammy, and then found out he was a girl, so I turned him to Samantha. Ah, oh, there so, you go. So, in terms of your rehoming and the other activities, how have you had to adapt to enable that to continue over the last year? Yes, it's, things have changed a lot. Um, we, at first, when the lockdown started, uh, the first two months of the lockdown, we couldn't do any rehome or rescue work at all. Mm. So things were just put on hold. And um, we rely a lot on work from the vets, obviously, because uh, we spend a lot of time taking cats to the vets. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were only doing emergency work. Oh, um, wow. uh, for that was the first two months. Then in May, we received some DEFRA regulations, which mm -hmm. said that we could resume our work uh, under very strict conditions. Uh, the main thing was you can't go into anyone else's house. And that meant that things had to change. Now, normally when a person is interested in a cat, they go to meet them, uh, which is very nice and normal. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. And it's especially, it's especially important when you're trying to home cats um, to families with children, because a lot of organisations won't home to children under a certain age, maybe under mm. 10 or under 5 and so on. Yeah. Well, we don't have those rigid rules. We say um, it depends on the cat, on the family, on the children. And therefore, we will send um, the family to look and meet the cat. As I said, all of our cats are cared for by fosterers and they're mainly in ordinary people's homes. So it's nice for the families to go to meet the cats in a home environment. Yeah. And I tell the fosterers to be careful, watch out and see particularly how the children react to the cats and vice versa. Now, of course, that's had to stop and we can't do that. So everything's now reliant on photos and videos, and we just put people in touch with the fosterers to discuss the cats, and then just have to go on that. Uh, and some people actually video their houses, um, and it's, it's, it's a bit like um, they're trying to sell their property, and here is the dining room, here is the lounge. Yeah. And I, I will put the litter tray over there, and yes. I will put the bed over here, and they show you, they give you a walking tour of their house, because again, when we do rehome, in the mm. past or in the future, we will go into people's houses and say, look, I think perhaps you'd better put the litter tray there or perhaps you'd better yeah. put the bed there because um, if you know anything, well, you know about cats is they don't like their litter tray next to their food. No. Uh, well, we wouldn't, would we? We don't like no. our toilet. No. Absolutely food, not. Um, <laughs> our, our breakfast table. Um, <laughs> so, um, we, but people don't think like that sometimes, especially mm. if they haven't had cats before. Uh, therefore, um, we can't do that now. So we send yeah. out uh, beforehand uh, a sheet of instructions, advice. And I say to people, even if you've had cats before, please read it. Because when you've got a new pet, you sometimes, if you've had an old one for a long time, you sometimes forget. So it's just to jog your memory with things. So I, I send out an advice sheet. Um, mm. And then we just have to talk people through now, where have you put the litter tray and have you shut that bedroom window and, and this sort of thing. Yes. <laughs> Cats have to have a bonding room and we mm. have to make sure that's safe and uh, happy for them for the first day or, or week yeah. or however long. Um, so um, we talk people through that. And then when we take the cat, um, 
we, we always take the cut to the people. They never collect the cut. We take the cut to the people. And again, we normally go in, have a cup of tea and check that the cat is happy before we go. Now we have to say, take the cat, put it in the room, open the carrier, leave it, come down, talk to me, do the paperwork outside in the garden in the pouring rain. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so many times I've had umbrellas up and we've been under people's gazebos and so on to try and... <laughs> it was okay in the summer. Summer was fine. Sit in the garden there. It was great. Yeah. Um, yeah. But now the weather is not so good. But we'll still have to do all the paperwork outside. I do as much of it beforehand as possible, but you still have to do um, a lot of the things and you have to get people to check things and so on. Yeah. Mm. And even before I go to a house... I have to read out a list of special COVID secure questions to them to make sure mm. that they have not been in, is uh, in isolation and, and so on. So we have to do all, all these sort of protocols. But even so, um, we we do our best and we manage to get our, our cats homed happily. Uh, and in fact, last year, we rehomed 137 cats. Wow, uh, that's even fantastic. Though, Goodness even me. Though we were closed for, for two months because two months, uh, the first two months of the pandemic, we couldn't do anything. And so 137 cats and kittens. Um, that and that is was just amazing. Small, well done, yeah. you. Thank you very much. We're very proud of that. Yeah. And out of those 137, only two had to come back for various reasons. And mm. um, we'll always do that. If, if there's a problem, we will always offer to take the cat back and... Mm. Uh, uh, those two were then rehomed somewhere else and it worked out. Um, so we're quite happy with that and so on. So that's the first thing, really. It's um, the change in the actual physical adoption process has had to adapt quite a lot. Yeah. Um, secondly, the vets. Oh, the vets has been a major problem for us because at first they were only doing emergencies. Um, yeah. But now they can do most procedures. But again, you can't go inside the building. So you have to ring up the vets and you make the appointment. You go there with dozens of other people in a packed car park and you're trying to get through on the line to the vets and you see people on their phone all the time and you ring and disengage and disengage. Eventually you get through and, you, and then you have to talk to them on the phone about the cats. Yeah. And, yeah. Then, um, and then they come out, the vet will come out and talk to you in the car park about the animal and then take the animal away with with them uh, to the inside to have the whatever treatment they need and sometimes mm -hmm. they'll ring up when they're inside and say well we found this what should we do and so on and then they have to bring everything out again so it's stressful for everyone concerned really but yes. it has to be it's just the way it has to be at the moment um Absolutely. but um that's that is a major thing once i was actually a full hour in the car park oh my hour, goodness uh, because um it just it just went on and on, and they got they get further and further behind all day uh, because it's far more time for the discussions outside, mm. in and yeah. out, in and out, yeah. and so on. Fortunately, we don't have to pay because we have an account at the at the vets. So you see people trying to um, put in put their card details in this machine, and it's pouring with rain in the car park. <laughs> yeah. uh, we don't have to worry about that. Um, yes. <laughs> but still, it's quite time consuming. So vet appointments are a uh, major difficulty. Mm. And thirdly, fundraising. People are, are very generous, but fundraising procedures have changed dramatically because mm. we don't get any grants. We're not like these big charities that yeah. um, get money from big corporate businesses and so yeah. on. We have to earn every penny we get. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of our fundraising, and we do get people who give us money on a regular basis, which is wonderful, thank you, yeah. because um, that is regular money. And uh, you can't, <laughs> that is extremely useful to yes. us, so we know that that's coming yeah. in. But our actual fundraising events that we got most of the money from in the past were things like fairs and uh, jumble sales. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a um, fashion show. We had one fashion show. We had one planned uh, for last year. We have a dog show. We can't have a cat show, not really, but we have a dog <laughs> show. Yeah. And um, But wait until I tell you a bit more about the cat show in a moment. We, we had a dog show planned. Mm. Um, we had one the previous year. Uh, and that raised quite a lot of money and a fair and a garden tea. I opened my garden, have a garden tea and cake oh, and so on. Yeah. Um, and we also have a regular weekly auction. One of our volunteers runs the auction with items that people don't want that are yeah. gifted to us, which is really wonderful. There's mm -hmm. smellies and candles and just lots and lots of things that yeah. people 
you know, good quality new stuff that people don't want. And there's always someone who wants to buy it. And so that's how we used to get most of our funds um, in the past. But now, of course, all those things have stopped. Uh, we can't do the auction. We can't do any of the fairs and so on. Fortunately, we have modern technology. Um, yes. And that's been an absolute boon because otherwise I think we'd have been closed. Um, yes. So what we do now is we have online events and competitions and special appeals. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, we had a tooth appeal because we got three cats in in one month, which needed who needed dentals. And yes. you know how expensive dentals oh, are yes. with cats. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, with cats, it's either the problems are either kidneys, dental work. Well, I think they're the two main things really that cost us yeah. a lot of a lot of money. Um, and uh, you were three in one month that came with that. So we put an appeal out, and we got a lot of people. Uh, gave us generous um, donations for that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I talked about a dog show. Well, we yeah. are actually having um, a best cat competition on Zoom. Amazing. So this is a cat show, a cat show on Zoom. We've already had about 15 entries, I'm sure. We'll probably get more. And this to enter your cat, you have to send your photograph and your little story about your cat. Um, and uh, we're in a competition to see which is going to be the best cat in each category. Uh, <laughs> so that's a way of raising. So rather than having actual dog show with actual dogs, the cats, I think some of the cats might be sitting next to the participants on the Zoom. Yeah. Because I've seen, I've seen that happen quite a lot in That'd Zoom meetings. Oh, you? yeah, I'll yeah. pop up all the time. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So that's how things have changed, but you just have to move on and... Uh, Hopefully, when we get back, we'll be able to have our shows and our um, meetings and so on, because mm -hmm. we do miss meeting people. Um, it's all it's it's good to see people online meetings and things. But um, as I'm sure everyone appreciates, it's not the same as meeting people no, in the flesh. Uh, definitely not. So hopefully we can get back to that soon. Absolutely. Yeah, I think we've all we've all missed the social events. Yes, yeah. we have. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're going to be planning some some of our own. So. We've seen people really coming together to help out their communities during a very difficult time. And we like to sort of ask all of our partner charities if you have any stories of acts of kindness that people have shown you. So the floor is yours, Carol. <laughs> yes, um, I agree. Many people have been very kind during the past year. We've had lots of people offering to help in, in quite a, a wide variety of ways. For instance, we have four new fosterers that have appeared during the year and that's marvellous for us um, and we've had people to offer help in other ways such as transport because it's it's quite often happens that someone will offer something and they're at the other a few miles away and I'll ring up a person and say can you go and pick that up and they'll go and pick it up and take it to where it's needed so transport has been very useful we've had people offering to socialize the cats that's a little bit of a problem at the moment because of the social distancing. But we have we've kept people's details and we'll be back in touch with them when we can. And also a lot of people have donated things to us. My tiles, the, the tiles outside my house where I say to people, leave things on the red tiles. My neighbours think that um, I'm just setting up my own little shop here uh, <laughs> because I have things um, for every time, several times a week. I will get um, cat food, litter, toys, towels, bedding, mm. lots of things left for us. For um, People ring up and ask, and I'll say, leave it on the red tiles, and we get these things. And so that's how we've got quite a lot of goods given. And also, people have sent us, pe people have been very generous um, sending us money, particularly at Christmas time. Uh, we've got quite a lot of gifts of, of money, which is, is really handy. And people have set up some standing orders as well. And this, a small amount, I mean, £5 a month is wonderful to us because, again, mm -hmm. it is regular income. Uh, so, yes, people have been very kind and we've been very grateful for everything that people have done. Lovely. We will obviously have your shop up to date with all the things that you need right now. But what thing in particular would you say Stockford Cat Rescue really do need right now? Well... The main thing that we spend a lot of money on that people can help us with mm. is actual cat food. Yeah. Um, last year, I was looking at how much we'd spent on various items. And in fact, last year, we spent £2,800 on cat food. Goodness. And that, that means uh, wet food, dry food, 
uh, treats, um, you know, these dreamies and, and this sort of thing, um, it was £2,800 um, approximately, uh, which was actually 10% of our expenditure. So that is a significant thing. Now, obviously, vet bills are by far the biggest bill, but we can't ask people to help us with vet bills. But certainly cat food would be very greatly received. And also litter, because mm -hmm. we spent a bit on litter. Yeah. Um, and then coming up to April, yeah. we will begin the new kitten season. Mm -hmm. And no matter how much we manage to encourage people to neuter their cats, there are always lots of kittens around from yes. April onwards and they need, therefore, they need kitten food uh, and they need kitten toys yes. because kittens just love to play. They do. So overall, really, cat food, litter and kitten toys would be very much very well received. Brilliant. We will make sure we do everything we can to make that happen for you. <laughs> Right, so there you go. That's all you're getting from us today. Nice and short one. Next week, we're bringing out another one on Monday, aren't we? We are, hopefully. Yeah, another one on Monday, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, and that's um, chatting with Sharon from WAG. And then we've got one very shortly after that with Steve Baker from In Hope in Bristol. Yeah. And also on Monday, we're going to have an interesting little discussion between yes, ourselves. Yes, we are. We and we're going to discuss, should people share the charitable things that they do on social media? It's a, an interesting topic to discuss. And if um, you have anything to add or you would like us to bring up, comment below. Yeah, if you want. All right, okay. see you on Monday. Ta-ra. <laughs>